whether you have a job where you're selling your services or you're selling a product, we're all selling something, but we have to become comfortable with what we're selling. And when you reach a point, let's say you do have a company and all of a sudden you realize that the product that you have isn't ethical, even though you thought it was, what do you do? Do you keep on selling it? Do you rush to make it ethical? Do you just shut down the company? Do you step on the public stage and say, Hey, you know what? We just realized that we're not doing a good enough job and we need to retract our steps and reinvent how we're doing things. Or do you say, you know, we're going to shut down because this isn't right. Like anytime you're selling anything, it's difficult to understand what the truth is. And if you do understand the truth, you might have to compromise your actual ability to sell something. So what should you do? Welcome to Care More, Be Better, a podcast for people like you who care about the social impact of conscious companies and everyday heroes. Hear inspiring stories from those who put people and planet before profit and personal gain. You'll learn how you can make a difference, vote with your dollars, and get involved today. Here's your host, Karina Belizzi. Hello, fellow do-gooders and friends. I'm your host, Karina Belizzi. Today, I'm thrilled to introduce you all to an incredible woman who has been named a Forbes 50 over 50, an Inc. Magazine's top 100 female founders, a UN, a food and wine magazine's game changer, a UN women's vegan revolutionary. I'm talking about none other than Miyoko Shinner. She is an award-winning chef, author, entrepreneur, and speaker who founded Miyoko's Creamery, which she started at the young age of 57, and is often credited for bringing vegan cheese to mainstream audiences. She also founded Rancho Compassion, a farmer, animal, sanctuary, and education center for school-aged youth. Miyoko is the author of six cookbooks, including the bestsellers, The Homemade Vegan Pantry, and the book credited for launching A Vegan Cheese Revolution. Artisan Vegan Cheese. She is currently under contract with 10 Speed Press Penguin Random House on a seventh book, The Vegan Creamery. Miyoko co hosted a vegan cooking show on PBS called The Vegan Mashup that aired for three full seasons and currently hosts a new YouTube cooking channel called The Vegan Good Life with Miyoko. She has been featured in all sorts of media and was even in a four-part Netflix series that we recently talked about when we connected with Chef Babette. That series was called You Are What You Eat, A Twin Experiment. Calling herself an Epicurean activist, she has worked tirelessly for over 30 years to reimagine a food system built on sustainability, equity, and compassion for animals. She has three grown children and resides in West Marin in Northern California with her dogs, cats, and close to 100 other animals. Miyoko, welcome to the show. Hi, nice to be here, Corinna. I have to say, as we get started, I I wanted to just reflect for a moment on the first time that I saw you speak in person and got the chance to meet you, and that was at Expo West last year. It was almost exactly a year ago, in fact. I'm leaving for the show tomorrow. So um, you delivered a keynote address, but then you were also on a panel of executives, some of whom were from the dairy industry, and you held their feet to the fire. I just wanted to thank you for doing that because it's not easy to go up against the Danons of the world and (laughs) speak truth and hold them accountable for, for treatment of animals and can definitely feel like the unpopular thing to do at times. I I definitely think it is the unpopular thing to do, but I'm sort of a rabble rouser, I've learned. Um, And part of it comes with age because I am now, you know, I only have so many decades left in my life. I'm in my mid 60s now. And if I can't speak the truth now, when will I ever speak the truth? Um, And so I just put myself out there. I think a lot of women, as they get older, just they're done with the the BS, and they just begin to become more of who they truly are. So as I reflect on this, you know, I find myself personally, I'm being 47 now, I feel like I'm more willing and able to also speak truth to media, speak truth to people, and really just not willing to gloss over some of those things that I think we would just dismiss in the past, like, oh, well, I'm not going to stand up and say something. And I just appreciate you so much for for being willing to be that voice. 
for so many people who who may not be able or willing to do that quite yet? You know, I, I, it's it's difficult still. Um, you know, especially on certain platforms and knowing that the so-called powers that be are not going to like what you say. And there is a, a narrative that everyone sort of abides by, which is, you know, you behave in a society, you talk theoretically about things like social justice and discrimination and racism and all of that. But, um, have you know, but heaven forbid that you actually voice it or, or, or actually show a real live example of it uh, because it, comes out of theory and into reality. And then next thing you know, people are offended. But the fact is, how how can we fight for social justice if we don't actually show real examples? And in our own industry, I mean, it's it's one thing to talk about, you know, during the Me Too movement or something like that, everybody got really riled up and there were women that were beginning to to come forward. And for for many years, they didn't want to come forward. Uh, same thing with, you know, Black Lives Matter. There was a silent oppression. And um, in some ways in the oppressed, uh, a willing sort of like you just put up with it because you don't want to be the nail that gets the hammer. You know, I have a, a very good friend who is, um, uh, she's the godmother of my children. And she is um, an 86 year old black woman. And she likes to tell the story of how she grew up in Georgia And when she was very, very young, uh, because she would talk back to the KKK, her mother sent her to California to live because um, if she didn't want to see her daughter hanging from a tree one day. And so that's a very extreme example. But in our industry right now, we talk about being in this industry that is about sustainability and social impact and justice and all of this stuff. But the fact is, there's a lot of really unethical things that are happening inside it. And there are people that are unable to speak out about what they've experienced uh, because they're going to get dinged. They're going to get criticized. They're going to lose their funding, you know, this, that, or the other thing. Money is always at play in this. And so it's important. You know, I've had this very unique opportunity for, of a lot, over the last year to talk to dozens and dozens of founders who've come to me with their stories and they cannot publicly share their stories. You're holding space for them, but you also, you lived that reality, right? Well, you know, I want to be the voice for others. I mean, I, I, someone has to speak up and say, this is really what's going on back behind the scenes. Like you may think this is a, you know, this industry is hunky dory and everybody's getting along and we're all about true impact, but the reality is different. And someone needs to actually say it. And I know I've made enemies, but at the same time, so many people have come to me and said, thank you for saying that because I couldn't say it. Well, we, we feel like we have what is essentially a gag order against us without having been given a gag order. Because if you are a woman-led business in an industry and you seek capital at some point, and I'm not even saying that's today, you just know that you might have to seek it at some point, you're already going into a world where less than 2% of the funding that comes from venture capital actually goes to female-founded or female-led companies, where when it does come your way, the, the strings that are attached to that are often not as favorable as they might be to a male-led business. And it's almost like assumptions are just made about what can be negotiated against you in that situation, again, because 98% of the funds go to other businesses. We saw this start to change a little bit before the COVID pandemic hit. Um, it was going as high as, I think, 4% for one year. And now it swung right back. And I think it's less than two again. Yeah. And if you're a woman of color, I mean, it's even the odds are even worse against you. Um, And then I'm going to throw in the activist bit. If you're an activist, in other words, if you really care about having impact and that's what your business is about, that all sounds sexy initially until you've got to just concentrate on the numbers. And then they see liability in a way too, because, you know, you're so committed to one specific let's say it's your, if it's climate or it could be something specific within a industry, like I am never going to use vitamin A sourced from palm, just as a, for example. I also want to talk about what's happening and to the orangutan 
and why it's so critical that we not like do anything specifically with palm, right? It could just be one example, but you also might use a little nut butter in something. And <laughs> I mean, I, I just wonder if it ever gets to the point where it's quite that extreme, where you are essentially singled out or dismissed because you you take a path so seriously when it comes to that activism. I, I think they can. I can tell you that they often, VCs will often ask you to moderate your tone or moderate the language because they say we have to appeal to a wider audience. You can't just be an activist out there. You know, you can't just be Greta Thunberg. I mean, you have to talk to a wider audience and talk about the health benefits and the things that are safe. And when you get into the activist realm and actually talk about things that actually matter, because we really don't have a whole lot of time left on this planet to do something about it, then, you know, that might in their mind impact sales. Mm -hmm. But see, I, I think they're wrong. Because the audience today is very different from, you know, an audience 50 years ago. I mean, today people are waking up, people are looking for leadership. People are looking for people with opinions that say, that speak the truth, that resonates with an audience. And people will buy a product just because they believe in the mission that is relentlessly spoken about by a company. I mean, you look at some, some you know, like, I can't say I 100% agree with Patagonia, but Patagonia doesn't sit around trying to sell their jackets. They talk about purpose and their idea of what their mission is. May not be my mission, but the point is it appeals to a lot of people. They're not toning it down. No, if anything, they've leaned in. I mean, that's a reality. That's what consumers are looking for. I mean, it's they're not looking for middle of the road because everyone's middle of the road. And if you're middle of the road, you're not distingu you're not distinguishing yourself from anybody else. You're just in the pack, just doing it for, for the money and people can smell that. And you're, you're not any different. You're not a leader. You're just middle of the pack. And who wants that? Do you think it's fear that's holding us back? I think fear is definitely holding people back. I mean, I can see that I get a lot of, you know, I, I literally get dozens and dozens of messages every single week, whenever I speak out on a topic about the industry. And I am inundated with people saying, thank you for speaking up. Um, this is what I've been thinking about, but I can't, I can't speak about it. They are all absolutely. And so, you know, we have to create an environment where people are comfortable to really discuss it. And, and so, yeah, I, you know, the last uh, year or so, I mean, I've always been an activist promoting a fighting against animal agriculture. Um, and also, you know, I had also begun to think up, speak up even before everything happened with me professionally you know, against, I guess, what I call the alt protein food tech space. Um, because I think there are issues around what we're saying is truly going to have impact. And, um, but, you know, much more so today. And yeah, I'm not popular like, I don't think a VC is going to give me a bunch of money anymore. And that's okay. If I start my next venture, I'm not going to ask them for money anyway. You know, I was thinking about this from the food perspective, because I have been an animal lover my whole life, but I've also been an omnivore my whole life until recently. Oh. And so this is part of the change that you helped to initiate. And it's, you know, it's something that I think has been coming for a long time. You know, I've connected with so many people over the course of my experience in the natural products industry. I started out selling fish oil and really putting Nordic Naturals on the map, right? So it was an experience of often talking to vegetarians about how they needed more omega-3 and how it was more important for them in some ways than people who weren't vegetarian because they just weren't getting enough. And it was hard to get it from flax and it was hard to do it from here or there, but now algae is a solution, right? And so over the course of the last um, several years, I've been working in the algae space and helping to, in a way, disrupt some of my earlier success in fish oil. Because part of what led me to leave Nordic Naturals after being there for almost a decade and leading sales, marketing, and education. I mean, it was second in command. It was a whirlwind tour, right? Was the fact that I stopped believing our sustainability message. 
that of course was not going to be popular, right? That's not popular within the company to say, raise a question and be like, well, you know, I know we're saying that the fish that we're sourcing off the coast of Peru is all friends of the sea certified and it's sustainable. But what about the 15,000 dolphins a year that are illegal, illegally killed there? Like they're poached. So if that's happening, then what else is happening that's beyond our control? And then, to, so you have that seed of doubt, right? Corinna, I, I love what you're saying. Um, in other words, you are evolving as a human being. Right. And then to take accountability for my role in an industry's success and then say, I'm not going to do this anymore. So, I mean, that is the, the question for everybody is, as long as you have something to sell, your vision of reality and truth will be compromised. So when you no longer have anything to sell, then um, you can really focus on what is really happening. But the question is, you know, we all have to, we're all selling something because we have to make a living in this, in, in the economic system that we're in. You know, we don't have a barter system or I don't know, you know, it's not like people, the government's doling out money to everybody. And so whether you have a job where you're selling your services or you're selling a product, you know, we're all selling something. Um, but we have to become comfortable with what we're selling. And when you reach a point, let's say you do have a company and all of a sudden you realize that the product that you have isn't ethical, even though you thought it was, what do you do? Do you keep on selling it? Do you rush to make it ethical? Do you just shut down the company? Do you go into the, you know, do you step on the public stage and say, Hey, you know what? Um, we just realized that we're not doing a good enough job and we need to, retract our steps and reinvent how we're doing things? Or do you say, you know, we're going to shut down because this isn't right. Like it, it, anytime you're selling anything, you're, it's difficult to understand what the truth is. And if you do understand the truth, you might have to compromise your actual ability to sell something. And so what should you do? I mean, it's a very, very, it's a conundrum. Well, and in my case, I'm, I've always been an environmentalist. I've, I'm a scuba diver. I love our oceans. I care about the health of them, right? And so it was not only that dolphin issue, right? Because it's never one thing, right? You know, at these, when you come to an awakening in any way, it's often the culmination of so many different events. But the moment I, I'd kind of reached that decision, it still took me a year to leave the company, right? Because I had become so ingrained, because I felt so much responsibility for it, because I was so integrated, it was my baby. It was your baby. You're a human being. And it's more than that, because we all need to feel like we belong. There is a culture that, you know, we used to live in tribes or in villages, and you're part of a community, and we're not anymore. And so when you have a job like yours, that is who you are. That is your culture. That is your community, your people. Um, and so to just like walk off because you had an epiphany is not something that is easy to do. No, it's not. Yeah. I mean, you've gone through something quite similar and at an even more focused level because you built Miyoko's Creamery. It's Miyoko's. It's your name, right? <laughs> so and can you talk to me for a moment about that experience? What is it like today when you think about everything that you were successful in building, perhaps how did that perspective change from when you were in it to where you are today? You know, that's, that's a really, really great question. You know, I always try to put mission out as the, the primary thing. You know, we, I was never afraid to speak out about what we were doing, but I think my blinders were that I was only thinking about animals. And I wasn't thinking about anything else. Um, there are other stakeholders in the food system that I had not considered because, you know, I've been vegan for so long. I've been an animal rights activist for so long. I was in that community. And that is really all I ever thought about. And it was my departure from Miyoko's that gave me the, the bandwidth to start reading other books, uh, like um, Vandana Shiva's books and, and reading more about well, what was the impact of the green revolution? You know, I mean, a lot of people are anti-GMO because, you know, they're, it's bad for the soil, it's bad for human health, et cetera. And that's what, you know, and then there's a lot of vegans that say, I don't care if it's GMO as long as it saves animals. 
And so, but, but nobody or very few people uh, really understand the political and economical and economical impacts of GMO on communities around the world. The fact that we have destroyed farming societies, that we have destroyed ways of life, that we have destroyed food sovereignty um, all over the world because, because Bayer, Monsanto own patents to seeds and control what is grown. You know, the Green Revolution helped catapult the success of the 10 biggest food corporations in the world that rely on commodity products, for example. And the fact that, you know, most farmers are simply growing commodity products that feed into this uh, corporatized, globalized food system to make packaged products, of which it turns out the average American consumes 50% on a daily basis. 50% of their diet is ultra processed food that comes from one of these corporations. So when you think about all of that, it, you know, GMO goes way beyond impact on soil and impact on human health. It impacts whether or not people in another part of the world eat or not, and whether or not, you know, their livelihoods have been destroyed, which they have. Um, and that is not something that I had room bandwidth to think about when I was running a company because I was entirely focused on on animals. And, and what I began to realize is that if we're going to reinvent the future of food, we have to do it in a way that considers the, uh, the benefit of all stakeholders. And that means, of course, animals. It also means people and not just human health, but economic success, health and, um, and the planet. And so we have to also consider all of these other aspects and ensure that whatever it is we are doing in this disruptive space of plant-based or vegan products or alt meat or whatever you want to call it, that we are not participating in the same destruction of food sovereignty, economic systems, uh, and soil as animal agriculture. And when I really began to think about all, a lot of this, um, it began pretty apparent to me that we're not as innocent and as pure and as truly impactful as we like to think we, we are, that many of the things that we do in this so-called alt meat, I don't know, food tech in, industry is basically repeating the footsteps of animal agriculture or these big conglomerates in the sense that we are going to be controlling the scenario. We are using GMO crops that are destroying um, livelihoods all over the world, but at the same time, we're controlling the narrative on who owns the rights to food. If one of our proteins becomes the primary protein in the world, for example, then it's owned by a corporation. It's not something that people can make on their own in their, their communities. And so it became to me really apparent that we need to think about this in a much bigger, more holistic way if we really do care, that, like we say we do. You've got me reflecting on an event I um, hosted last week. I was at Bifrost, which is a interesting event that brings people from the Nordic countries to the United States and lead this kind of summit where different innovative brands and companies come together to seek collaboration and investment and partnership with US based and Silicon Valley based like San Francisco, whatnot, pioneers in other industries and also VCs, right? And so I hosted a panel specifically on the future of food. And on one side was featuring Vaxa Technologies and the work that they're doing in algae to create sustainable solutions that are non-GMO, that use less resources to grow, that do great things, right? And I'm involved in a project with them to commercialize those products for human nutrition. And then another company that is doing very interesting things, but GMO in the space of barley. And what they're doing is genetically modifying barley constituents to accelerate the cultured meat space, right? So alternative future of food. Now, from a theoretical perspective, I just don't like GMO. I try to eat whole food, organic, and really don't see that in most cases, we've had a long enough view on the impact of what a GMO does to really make wise choices. We do things like 
create GMO corn and bring it to market and kill off flocks of butterflies and create huge problems for farmers that are trying to do things right because of cross-pollination and everything else that occurs in the world of nature. So when we try to manipulate things too much, we often make big mistakes. And those big mistakes can even be accelerated because they're profitable. And then suddenly that profitable enterprise, you now have, you know, every meat that gets eaten is essentially fed corn and soy. I didn't realize that they were feeding corn and soy to farmed fish, as a for example. And so I stopped eating farmed fish. And then when I stopped eating farmed fish, because I don't just want concentrated soy and corn in my life as a meat product. Then I decided to stop eating wild fish (laughs) because I said, if I'm part of the problem, I'm part of the problem, which, you know, this is all kind of my connection to fish oil and then saying, okay, well, I'm going to lean more into algae. I'll just take more of my omega-3s to make sure I keep my levels up successfully doing that. And then I'm interviewing people like you. I interviewed AJ Albrecht, who was leading Mercy for Animals. And I started doing research into how our farming conditions are actually set up for chicken and for cows and for, for pigs. And and it just, I had to stop. I just had to. So I understand fully wanting to make this focus all about the animals. And I also get that this is a far complicated, it's so complicated. The more I learned, the more I realized I didn't know. Yes. No, it's, it's very, very complicated. But how you we've know, organized food, like we've, we've, we've made food into a commercial enterprise is essentially yes, what we've, we've done. We've commodified food um, in a way that has created uneven distribution and access and, uh, and economic opportunities. Um, and most of that's happened over the last uh, century or so. I mean, this is a very, 60, last 60 years or so, this is a very unique time in history. You know, one of the scary things is that even in the United States, we've lost food sovereignty. So, you know, small farmers are shutting down. There is actually a concern that there won't be enough farmers uh, to take over because farmers are di- they're aging out, they're dying out. Um, there's been a serious decline in the number of farms, uh, small farms in the United States that actually do feed their communities because small farmers, small farms typically grow crops that people actually eat. Uh, that sounds crazy, but the large farms are growing the soy and the corn that are going to feed animals as well as biofuels or to sell to the Nestle's and the Unilever's of the world. And they're going into packaged products. So, and, and some vegan products, um, you know, some all proteins. And so the fact that we had this rapid decline in small farmers is a huge concern because the more we lose small farmers, the more we're going to lose access to um to food in our communities. Um, imagine if there were a, I don't know, some huge, um, we've had a lot of electrical outages here, but let's say the power grid went down all over the world, all over the country. Many parts of the country, people wouldn't be able to eat at all. Once the store shelves are empty, there'd be nothing left if there's no electricity because there's no small farms anymore. Distribution system completely collapses. You know, these are sort of potential threats in the future as the world gets crazier, but we need to be able to rely on our communities. We need smaller producers that are making small uh, batches of food to feed their communities. This is what the world used to be like. You know, we need to get back to eating a wider variety of crops. We need more biodiversity. All of that has been wiped out. You know, this is the reason I have always said it's best to do your shopping locally where possible. One of the criticisms I've often heard is that, oh, it's more expensive to do it that way. And I find that that's not the case. I participate in a local CSA. And so that means that I'm getting a shipment of fresh produce that's grown in the organic farms nearby to me and delivered to my doorstep once every couple of weeks, right? I use that primarily, but then I have to do some spot shopping between and I get the core elements that I need. I also want to dispel this belief for people that it has to be more expensive. I'll give you a, for instance, I went to Rayleigh's, which is the closest market to me. And I did some spot shopping yesterday. 
I walked out with three very full reusable bags full of groceries. And as I was preparing to leave, she stops me and goes, that was only $130. And I said, yeah, I, I mostly got produce today, you know, and I got a couple other odds and ends. And she's like, every single person I've rung up has been over $200 today. And I just really, I looked at what I got in my cart. There are two things that were different from probably most of the people shopping. One was there wasn't a lot of packaged foods, right? Two, there was no meat, none. And three, there was no wine and beer. So <laughs> I don't think I could have got out the door with that also in there. So we do make choices when we go to the store and the things that we buy. And even though I shop fully for organic with my produce, even though I'm going to, let's say, Aurelis, I, I like to go to the local natural stores too, like the Wild Roots or Staff of Life in my neck of the woods, but I don't always have them on my circuit. So do spot shipping where I can, shopping where I can. You can do so affordably. And even now I'm starting to buy grains from local growers up in your neck of the woods in Marin County, where they're, they're growing and milling organic grains and beans and things like that. So so I can buy stuff that's originating in Northern California within a hundred miles of my door, instead of something that was shipped from South America or from Asia or from somewhere else. So we can be part of this solution, but we have to support these local projects of these local farmers that are working to do things differently and better. Right. And I agree with you. I mean, those of us that can afford to do so, yeah, it might cost a little bit more, um, but I think if you take out all the packaged goods and the meat um, and the, you know, that, that you were talking about, uh, the cost of eating really is not very high at all. If you're buying whole grains, whole, you know, from the bulk bin, especially, and then from local farmers markets, um, you can eat pretty cheaply. I, I don't go to the store very often. I do have a big garden. So I can pretty much eat out of there and then I can buy, you know, I'll buy beans and rice and, and things like that just to sort of supplement it. And so I can sometimes go weeks without going to the store and buying anything. Um, but you know, it wasn't always like that. I mean, you know, I used to shop a lot more, I think. And when I did earlier, when my kids were growing up, I think I bought a lot more packaged goods. Well, I have two young boys, so it's sometimes difficult on that front as well. But getting them to convert Taco Tuesdays to Tofu Taco Tuesdays is something I'm presently working on too. And I, I'm finding it fun to get into the kitchen in a new way with them. Now, I have to ask you, I understand you also, you have a tattoo about your veganism. Can you share a story about that? Um, you know, actually, I've got two layers of sweaters on, so it'd be hard for me to take it uh, to show you. It's just phenomenally vegan. And I got it when I turned 60. It was my very first tattoo. Um, I found a local tattoo artist who was vegan and I did it on Facebook live. Um, and it was pretty fun. I mean, there were something like 30,000 people watching me get a tattoo. It was funny. Wow. Well, as somebody, I mean, I got my first and only tattoo at 42 as a gift to myself. So I imagine it was a gift to yourself to do that. It was. And it's, it's, you know, initially I felt a little odd, like I can't really show this. What do I do? And I actually like tried to cover it up for a while. And then, you know, summertime came around and I had to like take off my, uh, my sweater and things. Um, and it's been a sort of a conversation starter. People come up to me, you know, I don't know, in the streets of New York and they say, so um, how long have you been vegan for <laughs> or whatever? So it's... Well, how long have you been vegan? I have been vegan for over four, like mid 1980s. So yeah, it's been a long time. Um, but I am going to Japan in a couple of weeks to see my son and his family. And there I will have to hide my tattoo because you're not supposed to have tattoos in Japan unless you're Yakuza or part, you know, the Japanese mafia. <laughs> um, I, I wondered if you were um, willing to, to take a snapshot of what your trajectory has been and where you see your future headed now, when you were at Expo West last year, you mentioned that you were looking at doing something a little differently in the future and that you were open to the idea of creating more of a life, lifestyle brand or of helping people to create, let's say a thousand little micro creameries as opposed to just the one big creamery. And 
help people realize their dreams. I'm curious to see where you see yourself now. Okay. Well, I mean, I am right now immersed in writing this book, The Vegan Creamery. And the very first sentence of my introduction is exactly what you just said. You know, I hope this is the book that launches, you know, a thousand vegan creameries. Um, I really do believe that if we have a product that we think, or if we have a solution that we think can help save the world, why would we want to own the IP and reserve it for ourselves? Like, why would we not want to make it available to everyone so that more people can create that solution to save the world? And, um, you know, it's like the pharmaceutical company. Like if you've got a a drug that is life-changing, life-saving, the pharmaceutical company, you know, pharmaceutical companies aren't making it free. They're going to profit on it as much as possible. And the food, the food industry is going down that same path while there's, they're saying, you know, our product is going to make a huge impact. It's going to get thousands of people off of meat, you know, t- uh, millions of people off of meat, but we're going to own the IP so that we can control the scenario. And I don't agree with that. I feel like if we're really trying to make an impact that, and we really think we have a solution, then we should be sharing it. Um, and so I will, you know, I've been working on this book. I have all these amazing, honestly, I think amazing cheeses that I've been working on using a new hate to say it, technology, but, you know, just, I found new methods for making curds out of different plant milks and making cheese. And I'm going to be disseminating that information so that it will inspire more people to make vegan cheese and maybe lots and lots of companies instead of just one big company. So that's one thing. But the other thing has to do with the lifestyle component that I was talking about. And it's taken a long time, but I'm just going to throw it out there. Um, We are in the midst of trying to create the world's first vegan village by buying an entire village in Italy and creating not just an intentional community, international intentional community of vegans, but having vegan stores and restaurants and becoming an aspirational place where people will want to come from all over the world to see it can be done. You know, maybe it can even be a reality show of uh, as we create this place. But I really, truly believe that, you know, one of the things that we, one of the problems we have in the world in the United States is a loneliness epidemic. Uh, The Surgeon General actually said it is an epidemic. Half the people in the country are lonely. And because we are now more isolated than ever with our digital platforms, and we need to figure out ways to uh, reignite a sense of community. And, uh, togetherness. We have to recreate tribes. So we are going to try to create the world's first vegan village. And we've chosen Italy as that place. They've got lots of abandoned villages uh, that are looking for residents. And we think this is a great opportunity to do it in a country that also honors tradition and a traditional way of eating. Uh, And of course, there is definitely meat in the Italian diet, But at the same time, they have a long history of something called cucina povera, which is peasant food, which was predominantly plant-based. You know, like lots. And they are a culture of food. They are a culture of food. And they're not a culture of packaged food or processed food. They're a culture of real food. And so can we do a vegan version of that uh, that is based on their long tradition of cucina povera and do it in a town that really celebrates their gastronomical culture as well, uh, but bringing it, in, bringing it into the future in a way that's more compassionate and sustainable. I love that. I just got the full body chills happening over here because it just, it's, it's such a beautiful idea. And the reality of doing it somewhere like Italy, where the climate is really near perfect a lot of the year, where there is a, it's just so deep in tradition that I can imagine some really incredible vegan dishes coming out of this. Um, like I'll give a, for instance, when I traveled into the Chingua Terra arena and I hiked the trail, I did this all by myself, which I would never recommend. It's too romantic of a place. People should always go with at least one person so that you can get a two top when it's time to dine and things like that. But um, the use of potatoes And place of, uh, in place of noodles in a way, like I had a, what I would call a typical pasta dish, but with potatoes and, and like a red sauce and then olives and other vegetables kind of all thrown together. 
And it was divine. It was nothing I would ever find in an Italian restaurant yeah. here. No, no. They're simple ingredients. Um, in Italian food, American Italian food is not exactly what you have in Italy. And every region in Italy has very different food. So there's no such thing as quote unquote Italian food, you know, unless you're talking about pasta pomodoro, you know, that's about it. So. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you find that as a side dish, but you know, there's all sorts of exploration of the available, the available food. And I, I just love that culture so much. I'm, I'm obviously I'm part Italian. I'm also married to an Italian, Italian American. My, um, my father's half Sicilian, half French. So oh, okay. I have some exposure to that side of the world. Now, we spoke a little bit for a moment earlier about kind of abandoning fear and leaning into these things. And I see you as being, this is your power of influence today, of abandoning fear, of abandoning fear and leaning into the future and the future that you truly envision something that you, it's, it seems like you know you can create it. So I just want to, for a moment, respect that and hear from you how you got to this knowing. Because I think all of us want to be on that journey with you. We want to be in that knowing. I don't know that I know. So thank you for crediting that to me. But I think you might have more confidence in me than I do. You know, I'm a person of constant self-doubt, self-reflection, wondering if what I'm thinking is right, whether what I'm thinking is wrong, whether I should post something that I'm thinking about, because what if it backfires um, and, you know, people hate me and and yeah, and they do. Um, and then I do it anyway. So I always have questions. You know, I, I always wonder is what I'm writing, does it make sense? Um, what about this product that I'm trying to work on? What about this idea? I've always um, had self doubt. Um, I live with fear. I do everything. You know, I'm not like this brazen person who's like, I don't care. I'm so, I'm so bold and, and uh, fearless. It's, it's just not true. I do it despite the fear, you know, I do it because what else am I going to do? So I don't think I'll ever be at a point where I'm completely hundred percent confident. You know, I, I've given a lot of talks and I should be comfortable by this point in speaking in front of an audience, but I am, you know, I'm like overwhelmed with fear until the words start to leave my mouth like stepping onto that stage, I am like this. Um, it's like that with everything, you know? I, I'm just a human being trying to figure out my path in life. Well, I think what you've described for us is, is a trait of bravery because when you do something in spite of the fear that's there, I mean, that's truly what makes it a brave act. I personally also get that little bit of stage fright or the butterflies in the belly and have that same experience of until I'm speaking, it's you know, you felt clammed up a little bit or not sure of what you plan to say. And then you're suddenly in it and something changes. So I love that. Now, I'm really curious if you have a specific favorite cheese that you would like to share with our audience. Is there a specific favorite cheese that you have that they could perhaps go out and either taste or try or learn from you, whether it be on your YouTube channel or in your upcoming book. I just I'd love for you to share it. Well, okay. If you hold on, since this is visual, I'm going to just pull something out from behind me. Give me one second. So I have been working on, I'm going to try to do this blue chip. I don't know if I can, I'm going to put this down and then adjust. Can you see, I'm, I've been working on blue. I'm looking on a, it looks like a blue cheese. That's exactly right. So, I mean, that is uh something that I've been working on and I've had quite a bit of success um, recently. It took me a, a number of tries, but. So is it similar to a Roquefort or something like, like that? It's like a Roquefort. Yeah. I call it Rancho Roquefort. Oh, wow. So that is uh, something I'm really excited about. But uh, this is, you know, it's trial and error. It takes about four weeks to make this for the mold to grow, but it's made out of the milk of two different seeds. Um, and it forms these beautiful curds that, and the, the mold can grow in between the curds. So this will be in my homemade, uh, in the, uh, the vegan creamery cookbook. So you'll know how to make it next year. Um, at the same time, I do have a YouTube um, uh, episode on making halloumi. I call it malumi because it's made out of mung beans. So it's, that's a relatively simple recipe. Um, and I have to admit that I 
have never actually had halloumi because I went vegan when I was so young, but people kept saying, can you make a vegan halloumi? So I actually read up on like, what's it like? What are the characteristics? And then I made one and uh, people have really said they, they love it. So <laughs> I don't know. Although apparently I forgot the most important thing because this was not in the articles that I read is that you're supposed to put a mint leaf inside the cheese for the mint flavor to infuse. That's what someone from Cyprus actually said. So it, that would be easy to do. I'm going to add that to my recipe, um, but the actual, you know, the recipe for the cheese itself, and then you can just put a mint leaf in it so it can infuse the flavor is uh, available on my YouTube channel, The Being Good Life in Yoga. Well, I really just have to say, I appreciate all of the work that you are doing. Um, I will say this again, to go forward with bravery and to to be willing to speak with power against, in some cases, some some pretty big shots out there that are, are working to um, sell a story and gloss over kind of the things that they might be doing behind the scenes. So I, re- I just think we need more of that in this culture. We need more space for that. We need people that are, are willing to use their platforms to do all of that. I know you've spoken on LinkedIn to say things like, you know, I might not ever get investment capital again, but it's important I talk about these things. So somebody is, and I feel like that couldn't be more true. So it's, it's an amazing thing. I believe you're an asset to all women in business and beyond. And I very much look forward to connecting with you again in person. I'm planning to buy my ticket to your Compassion um, fundraiser. Oh, Rancher Compa. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Look forward to seeing you there. Yeah. I'm hoping that this will actually be published that week. I believe it's a Thursday night. So this would be maybe the Wednesday before and um, get to follow up with some uh, personal stories about that event as well. But I'm just very excited for the work that you're doing, for the animals that you work to save, and for inspiring me on a journey to become a vegetarian that is leaning more every day towards veganism. Well, congratulations, and thank you for doing that. It was hard at first, but then I was like, I haven't had dairy in, I don't know, a year? Good for you. Yeah. And then I haven't had fish in, I don't know, a few months, right? And then I really don't feel like eating the beef anymore. I really don't feel like eating the pork anymore. And so, you know, I think the last thing is I still get, you know, some egg in the cooked cookies that I make for my kids and things like that. But that's easy to substitute. But at some point when you're on this journey or going down this path, foods like, I don't know, beef and f- chicken, they stop looking like food to you. They will, like you just won't even look at it and desire it because it, it'll be like, why would I eat that? I wouldn't eat this. I wouldn't eat my computer. My computer, neither is this, you know, that's an animal. <laughs> so, Yeah. Well, and being in the natural space, I mean, I've been following Dr. Michael Greger for some time. I've also been looking um, closely at Dr. William Lee's work and all of these individuals who are at this forefront of health and science-based nutrition are saying the same thing. And they are saying plant first. If you're going to continue with animal products, consider it a condiment. Don't eat food out of a box unless you really know what the ingredients are. And let's like get you back in the kitchen. So you're right. I'm a hundred percent there. I, I just, I think that's where it makes sense. And when you hear people like Jonathan Safran Foer, who is both a novelist and an environmentalist and also a vegan activist, he says, you know, no meat before dinner, no animal products before dinner. If everybody did that, we'd be in a better space. We know it would be better for our climate. And so while my path hasn't been purely starting from an animal ethics space, and while it hasn't been purely from an ecological space, it's kind of been this becoming. And maybe it's, that's a better word than awakening because it's, it's something that's happening in stages. I will say my skin's a lot clearer since giving up dairy. I never realized the connection. Dairy for me made my, I, I had a acne. And I had it through adulthood and gave up dairy and acne's gone. There you go. So, you know, you know, what you just said about we are, instead of uh, awakening, it's a becoming. And we are all becoming. We're human beings. So we're always becoming something. Um, and we're evolving. And so we're all on a journey. 
none of us on any path that we're on are ever there in terms of perfection, even as a vegan. So we're all becoming, and I think that was, that was beautifully put. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. And I can't wait to see you again on the 28th. I can report back to you about the craziness of Expo West. All right. I have fun. That's all I can say. <laughs> Great. Thank you for having me on. Oh, thank you so much. To find out more about Miyoko and stay abreast of her incredible journey and her important work, I encourage you to visit her Instagram and Facebook pages at Miyoko Shinner and also her YouTube channel, The Vegan Good Life with Miyoko. I personally find them to be incredible resources, especially on my own path to veganhood. As always, I will be sure to include links to everywhere that you can connect with her and find her cookbooks. If you want to shop for them, in fact, I'll put them in my Amazon shop, which is also linked in show notes. You can find these resources, links, and so much more when you visit caremorebebetter.com. So visit the site and join us on this journey to build a better and brighter future. Thank you listeners and watchers now and always for being a part of this pod and this community, because together we really can do so much more. We can care more. We can be better. We can even shift our consumption habits, vote with our dollars and build a more equitable world that respects powerful women like Miyoko and kicks the limiting conventions of the past right in the teeth. You can be that rebel, perhaps capture a little bit of that Miyoko spirit. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Care More, Be Better, a podcast for social good. To make sure you never miss an episode, subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to podcasts. And share with your friends to help us reach more people and spread more social good.